uh, I reserve the right to comment a little bit, and then we engage in the fierce uh, conversation. Uh, Jean-Claude, my notes of the last year are, uh, of course, uh, dated uh, uh, beginning of October. So beginning of October, you were absolutely right. Jay Powell was saying inflation in the US is transitory. And I have reasonable expectation that in the course of next year, namely 22, we will be around 2%. He said that in October. And uh, you were right when you said all central banks more or less were saying the same. By the way, I have to say the modeling, and John was very clear on that, the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model are plain wrong when you are in a very rapid period of transition. We experienced that with the real economy in after Lehman bankruptcy, mm -hmm. and we are experiencing that because Jay Powell could not say that without having some papers by uh, the thousand of PhD that, we, that are in the staff of the, of the Federal Reserve. So, so there we have an immense problem, uh, which explains largely the lags. There are other technical re, uh, reasons for the lag uh, to have been considerable, because in November he said it's not transitory, and the first increase of rates is only in March. So a big, big uh, delay between the lucidity, recovered lucidity, and, and what, what they did. In my opinion, it's also due to the fact that they had, uh, I would say, some kind of link between the, the uh, non-conventional quantitative part of monetary policy and the conventional interest rates. They said we, we will increase interest rates only after we have stopped the net purchases of tradable securities. It was said on both sides of the Atlantic, and it was one of the reasons why there was an additional delay of five months, six months, depending on the, on the central bank. That was, in my opinion, in retrospect, a big mistake to link the two. As far as I am concerned, I was not preaching the fact that there was no problem. I wrote myself, don't follow the I, prophets. I was not accusing you. The, 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 no, 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 but, but you could. The I prophets. Just quoting your, your colleagues. Yeah, but, but I, I, I've colleagues. always been against the theory according to which interest rates were eternally very low and that you had to borrow massively in order to be uh, uh, in the best uh, situation possible. Uh, a lot, unfortunately, it was a little bit uh, close to a conventional wisdom at a certain moment. It, wa it was obviously wrong. Uh, other um, remark, I'm not sure that we have the same figures as regards core inflation. I look only at core inflation, and I look at core inflation as is published by Eurostat for, for uh, Europe and by the uh, statistical office in the US. We have the same level of uh, core inflation, which is around 6.3, 6.5%. I have the figures for the euro area, 6.6% in November. 6.6 .6 is not 4. 6.6 .6 means that even if you put aside oil and gas and the agro products, you still have a level of inflation which is impressive. And uh, the job of the central banks is to get down from 6.6 .6 to 2% in three years' time, as I think they, they can. But uh, the fact that we have the same level of uh, underlying inflation, say uh, core inflation, on both sides of the Atlantic, and not the same level of headline, underlines what has been said by many of us, namely that there are differences between the US and Europe, because in, the US, in, in Europe, it's very much more of a supply problem, and in the US, it's much more of a demand problem. And uh, I give you the headline, headline 10% in Europe, 7.7, last figures I have in mind, for the US. So 2.3 full percent difference, which means that the real economy in Europe is attacked by, uh, by uh, uh, the situation, by inflation, and by the war in Ukraine much more, of course, than in the US. 
So that explains why the monetary policy in Europe is much more benign than the monetary policy in the US. But both seems to me exactly appropriate. If we want the core inflation to get down, because again, even in Europe, it is not only oil, gas, and uh, agro products. Uh, they are, and uh, I'm not sure that I am in full agreement with the idea that there is no spiraling of uh, prices. To, to get 6.6%, you must have some spiraling of prices. Not massively yet wages and salaries, but in the US, you have 6% wages and salaries. So practically the level of core inflation that I was mentioning. So I think we, we have to be very careful, including in Europe, because we, we have more, more or less the same problem. But I agree that uh, it is good that there is a difference of interest rates, uh, which is significant, very significant, to be frank, between the US and Europe. And of course, it has also the inconvenience that was, yeah, that was uh, underlined by our co Korean friend, namely uh, the euro is weak and it, we import inflation in Europe, that's clear. Uh, and that's, that's a problem. But I will not call for accelerating the increase of rates in Europe, but I'm, I'm reasonably satisfied when the both, I would say, interest rates are going up uh, calmly, quietly, but, uh, but uh, firmly, because, because it's very important that we are all convinced, all, uh, I would say, economic agents are, are convinced that 2% is credible in the medium term, which is not absolutely obvious uh, today, <laughs> frankly speaking. Uh, two, two other remarks. One, on, on the fact that uh, we, will, we are likely to have inflationary pressures in the time to come, it's uh, probably a secular, of a secular nature and not of, a, of a, I would say, cyclical nature. We have the green transition. It was mentioned. I think it's very important. We have deglobalization, which has been mentioned with nuances, but I think it's part of the fact that uh, in comparison with the previous period, we have to expect more pressures, say, upward for, uh, for the prices. And we have the blue collar uh, issue or the uneasiness of the uh, middle class or the lower middle class and so forth. It seems to me that it is already there. And uh, to the extent that in some respect, the US is a little bit the leader, I interpret the sequence Trump-Biden as, uh, I would say, accompanying the emergence of the blue collar uh, furious, <laughs> I would say, uh, uh, <coughs> infuriation uh, transmitted in the political arena. Because clearly, to imagine that uh, the Republican candidate for the presidential election could not be the, the, the I would say, the, the, the guy defending big business, but the guy defending blue collar is really something which uh, is absolutely incredible. And, and the Biden, of course, uh, is on the same line. For, for very good reasons, of course. So I, I mentioned that, and I take it that uh, in all European countries, as you said, uh, uh, clearly it is also, Pierre, it, it, it's also the case. I mean, we, we have to expect, but it will play the role of a pressure, an inflationary pressure also, because you need labor costs are inflation, <laughs> arithmetically. So a, a, a last point uh, I wanted to, to, to mention also, uh, uh, we, we are in a situation where you mentioned uh, Minsky, animal spirits, uh, <laughs> it's absolutely clear that, uh, that we have, uh, uh, we, we had abnormal situation uh, that you consider part of capitalism and uh, Keynes uh, said that also eloquently, uh, Minsky uh, very eloquently, so I, I think it's uh, undeniable. But from time to time, you have situation which looks a little bit out of historical record. And we are very close to situation where accumulation of debt, piling up of debt, uh, accumulation of incredibly accom accommodating policies over 10 years, 
uh, and um, uh, this very rapid change of uh, monetary policy for good reasons, all that creates a universe which, frankly speaking, seems to me a little bit less rosy <laughs> than was said by most of us, frankly. So I don't want to be l'oiseau de mauvais augure, but it seems to me that maybe we have serious problems ahead of us. Mm -hmm.